The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. I know it's customary for you guys when you see me up here to think I'm going to start off with some sort of a height joke. And I tried this week, I really did, but I, I came up short. Um, <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, it is Mother's Day, so I want to first uh, recognize the, the mothers in attendance this morning. So if, you, if you're a mother, I want you to just raise your hand. I want to embarrass, well, yeah, I do want to embarrass you. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Now, let's take a minute just to thank our mothers for giving us the gospel. But I also want to recognize today that uh, it can be a very difficult day for some as well. Uh, we want to honor our mothers, and yet some of you may not have your mothers around anymore. Uh, maybe you don't know your, your mother. Uh, maybe your mother was less than motherly, and so a, a thought of her brings uh, a pain or a consternation in your soul. Uh, maybe it just brings up painful memories. So I want to recognize that as well. It's a, it's a day that we celebrate, but I know for some it can be tough, so I want to, to point that out. Let's open up from prayer before we, we start then this morning. Father, we come humbly to you. I come humbly to you as we seek your word this morning. I want to pray and, and thank you for all the mothers here, the ones who gave us life, if nothing else. If, if memories of our mother is, is painful, we thank you at least for the fact that they have brought us into this world that we might worship you. But I pray that you would bless them today, that you would be with husbands and children as we try and honor them today. But I pray for mothers who perhaps woke up this morning and they have lost a child. Be with them this morning as well. Use this weak vessel this morning as we go through your word to hopefully bless them and encourage them. In Christ, it's my prayer as we think about this, that you would be with us this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in your Bibles, if you would open up to 2 Timothy. So the natural order of things, of course, is that 2 Timothy comes after 1 Timothy. We'd expect that, right? You wouldn't go 2 Timothy first, then 1 Timothy. It doesn't make any sense. But you'll also see that it's before the letter to Titus. However, what you may not know is that 2 Timothy is actually the last letter that Paul wrote, at least the last one that we have recorded from him. It's the last letter that Paul wrote before his death. So 2 Timothy actually comes after Titus chronologically. So I'm going to set the scene for you as we think about 2 Timothy. Paul, who is in prison now for at least the second time in Rome, he's awaiting death. He knows that it's, it's coming, that it's very imminent, and he may not know when, but he knows that this is, this is probably it. And he says as much as he writes in chapter 4, verses 6 or 7, he says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So Paul knew this was coming, and he even predicted this earlier in one of his other letters. When he wrote to the Philippians, he said this, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering, and here he is some years later sitting in this prison, and he's being poured out. But notice that it says that he is being poured out, Not that he is pouring himself out. You get the image that God has taken him and he's pouring Paul out. The Greek there is is spendomai. Spend. It's a present verb. It means it's ongoing. It's continual. He is being spent in the service of God and God is the one spending or pouring him out. And now as he sits in this prison, there's not much left in this vessel. The vessel will be empty soon. So how's that for encouragement for Mother's Day? We will. So not only then is his life just about ready to end, and again, he doesn't know when, but it's soon. But the things at the end for Paul have not been all that great. Later in this letter, he says this, You are aware 
that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phyglius and Hermogenes. In chapter 4, he writes this, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. The Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. And later he says this, At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me may not be charged against them. And he goes on to mention some, some people that did, that did stand by him later on in the letter, but for the most part, a lot of people have left Paul. He's, he's alone in prison here, except for Luke. And yet Paul still has this hope, doesn't he? What then gives Paul this, this hope as he's sitting in prison waiting to die? Better yet, why am I preaching this on Mother's Day? How is a day that we, we take to recognize and honor our mothers relevant to a man who has described himself as a sacrificial offering about ready to be poured out? And that's the question I want to answer for you this morning. So I'm going to, tech, I'm going to start this morning by reading the text, and now we're going to be traveling all over 2 Timothy. It's going to be centered in these verses. So if you look with me at chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus to Timothy, my beloved child. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gives us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So let's start in verse 1 then. Paul, he says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. And so Paul reminds Timothy at the very outset, you know me, Timothy, and I am I'm an apostle. I'm one who has seen the risen Christ in a dramatic fashion. He's in, he doesn't say by his own choice. I'm, I'm an apostle by my own choice. Paul wasn't looking to become a Christian, was he? We know his story quite well on the road to Damascus. Paul, who then saw, was on his way to persecute the Christians, the disciples of the Lord, but then he encounters them, or he encounters the Lord, and now he went from persecuting to proclaiming the name of Christ. He wasn't looking to sign up for this, but God took him and he snatched him, and now what else could he do except for praise his name? We tend to think of Saul's conversion, at least I did growing up, as this, as this very dramatic, something very unique event. Yeah, of course, Paul gets it because look what happened to Paul as he's walking down this road, and he has this experience. But I want you to think about it. Though the circumstances of each one of us might be different, all of the conversion stories really are the same, aren't they? That God takes a person who hated him, and he changes his heart, and now we love him. That's what happened to Paul. Those who breathe out threats against the Lord, if not in public, then in their own hearts, and then God blinds them with the light of the gospel, so that now they were blind, but now they see. But it isn't just by the will of God, it's by the will of God, what? According to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. That's a remarkable thing for Paul to say, isn't it? That's all he has left to hold on to. His death is imminent, so he says, according to what? The life that is found in Jesus Christ. And he remembers that his apostleship was due to God's will according to the promise of life, as he sits there waiting for death. The life in Christ is really a constant theme in Paul's writing. Indeed, in a very real sense, he will soon practically know what he wrote to other believers when he wrote, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then we get the recipient of this letter. Verse 2, he says, To Timothy, my beloved child, And who then is is Timothy? Timothy was a young man, one of Paul's co-workers in the gospel ministry. Calls him his beloved child. Not genealogically, but spiritually. 
That's a very important fact, as we're going to see here in a few moments. In fact, it amazed me as I was prepping for the sermon this week how often Timothy is actually mentioned by Paul in the Bible. It's a lot more than we think. I think we just kind of gloss over that sometimes when we just read it because it's a salutation and it becomes mundane to us. But I want you to listen to this. Listen to all the times that Timothy is mentioned and how important he really was. In Acts 16, we get the first mention of his name. It says this, Paul came also to Derb and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. And later on he says, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. In Acts 18, we read this, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. Acts 19, and having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Acts 20, in the list that Paul gives of those who accompanied him on his missionary journeys, we read Sopater, Aristoc, Arist- first rule of preaching, young men, don't pick a passage with names you can't pronounce. <laughs> Secundus, Gaius, Timothy, Tychius, and Tophius. And then at the end of Romans, before his well-known doxology, Paul is signing off here. He says, and Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So Timothy is a constant and reliable companion to Paul. And when things were going bad for Paul, when things were going bad in the churches, Paul relied really heavily on Timothy. 1 Corinthians 4, For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me. This is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. To an example of what it's like to be godly, I sent you Timothy. So as things are falling into disarray, he sends Timothy, his beloved and faithful child. And he cared for Timothy. You find later in that same book, Paul saying this, Now when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as I am. Let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me. So Timothy is a valuable asset for Paul. You find him again with Paul. Paul writes to the Corinthians a second time. He says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. He's with him again as Paul writes to the Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are to Philippi with the overseas and deacons. Again, when Paul wants to bless them, he sends them Timothy, or he wants to send them Timothy. He writes this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely interested and concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Again, Timothy is mentioned in Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So to the Corinthians, the Philippians, the Colossians, and now the Thessalonians, Paul writes this, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. Paul sent them this gift of a man as well in his ministry. He writes this, Therefore we could bear no longer. We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel to establish and exhort you in the faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. So when Paul wanted something done and he couldn't go himself, he sent Timothy to exhort them because of Timothy's worth. And so it seems that not properly so, the most talked about person in Paul's writings, of course, is Jesus as it should be. And the second most talked about person is this young man, Timothy, who eventually becomes one of the pastors at Ephesus. So it's only fitting then, as we look at 2 Timothy, that Paul, at the end of this letter, would request none other than Timothy to be with him. Near the end of the letter, he he implores him, do your best to come to me soon, Timothy. I need you. Indeed, Timothy's name means precious one of God. And so being precious to God, being God's co-worker, in fact, in the gospel, he's also precious to Paul. And we see evidence of this as we go back to our text and finish off verse 2 into verse 3. Paul writes to Timothy this, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom whom I serve, 
as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you, Timothy, constantly in my prayers night and day. He writes, I thank God. And what prompts him to thank God? Well, the fact that he remembers Timothy constantly in his prayers. Timothy was of such a help and of such the same spirit that while he is absent of Paul, he is always on Paul's mind. The same way that a son would be on the mind of a father. So Paul reveals something here that gives us a bit of insight on perhaps why this bond between himself and Timothy is so strong. And I want you to file that away. Notice that he thinks that he thanks God whom he serves, and then he says, as did my ancestors, the Jews. His ancestry is that of the Jews, as recorded in Acts 22. Paul says this, And I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Sicilia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. And when Paul is accused of starting riots among the Jews, Paul defends himself this way. He says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which some call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God. So again, file that away for a moment. But going forward now to verse 4, he says this, Paul continues his demonstration of affection for Timothy. He says this, As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. So here Paul reflects not only the affection that he has for Timothy, but he also remembers the affection that Timothy had for Paul. And these tears, I, I remember your tears. Now we're not told exactly what these tears are for or when they were shed. Now a couple of options are these. Perhaps this is a reference to Acts 20. We read this, And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, bearing sorrowful most of all because of the word that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Now this is Paul talking to the Ephesian elders, and so perhaps the thought is that Timothy is among them, and he's one of the ones saying goodbye. Perhaps his, tear was, his tears were out of concern for Paul, knowing that Paul was in prison again, and at this time it didn't look so good for his release. Now whatever they were, Paul says that he longs to see Timothy, that he may be filled with joy. In fact, one commentary breaks down 2 Timothy like this, based on this passage. He says that the thought of the writer's longing to see Timothy recurs so strongly in verse 4-9, so that the letter as a whole is bracketed by this strong emotional tie. So it's Timothy, I greet you. Timothy, come soon. And everything in between is the exhortation that he gives to Timothy. That's how one commentator broke down the, the book. What then is it specifically that Paul is remembering about Timothy, aside from his tears, that would fill him with joy and create in him this longing to see him again. And he answers in verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you. I want you to know, mothers, that the elder board has helped you out here. Okay? When we were talking about who's going to preach this morning, as Ken was going to be out of town for the week, he said, it's Mother's Day, I need someone to preach, what do you have? So I said, well, I have a sermon I've been working on, it's called The Tragedy of Judas. Not a great Mother's Day sermon, I guess. <laughs> I said, okay, well, how about the Nephilim? Giants in the land. And I got blank stares, so here you are, Second Timothy. <laughs> Anyhow, when I prayed about and I thought about what to preach for today, this passage came on my mind. It was this text specifically, verse 5. What better, better way to honor motherhood than this? Let me read it again. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. You need, we've, we've proven that Timothy was a special young man, a precious one of God, precious to Paul. But what did God use in his gracious means to nurture Timothy and build him up into this, this man that he was? Well, he answered it. It was his mother and his grandmother. Remember I said to file something away a few minutes ago about the, the tie between Paul and Timothy. In verse 3, Paul says, I thank God whom, I'm, whom I serve, as did my ancestors. And now... Paul calls upon and credits Timothy's ancestry as well, his mother and his grandmother. My ancestors served the Lord 
And I know that your ancestors served the Lord. The faith that these two women had was passed down generation to generation. So I want you to think about this morning, what a blessing it really is to be raised in a home where God's word is present. We take that for granted, especially in this country. There are are places in the world where you can't do that, where it's not done. It was a command to God's people to know his word. From From the oldest to the youngest, Deuteronomy 11 says this, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when sitting in your house, and when you're walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. All the time in the home, you talk about my word. The book of Wisdom in Proverbs says this, Hear, my son, your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland for your head and, and penance for your neck. I think some people think that it's really the, just the father's job to instruct his children. And it is the father's job to instruct his children. But it doesn't give mothers off the hook, and vice versa. Mothers, you're with your children more often in many cases than, than the fathers are. Every day. All day. But what about Timothy's father? Notice that Paul didn't mention him. If you go back to Acts 16.1, we read that a minute ago, we find more information about Timothy's father. It reads this, Paul also came to Derb and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. That's all we know about Timothy's father. He was a Greek. And the writer of Acts calls Timothy's mother a believer, but he does not say the same thing about his father. So I think it's safe to reasonably conclude, that since there's a comparison there, that he was not a believer. We don't know if he's still on the scene. We don't know if he has died, if he's left. We have no idea about Timothy's father. But all that is mentioned here is his mother and his grandmother. Paul served as Timothy's spiritual father. But there was a faith there even before Paul came on the scene. And how do we know that? I want you to look ahead in 2 Timothy 3. Jump to 2 Timothy 3. Paul is exhorting Timothy here. And he writes this. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. And then listen to this. He says this, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge in the truth. Notice then how he has spoken of Eunice and Lois. They are not one of these weak women, but women rather with a sincere faith. You see the contrast there. Whatever came about, these two women were not fooled. They knew the scriptures. But then Paul contrasts Timothy with this group that he just described. He writes this in verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings. And then in verse 14, he says this, As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. And now listen to this. How from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. From childhood, Paul was acquainted with the Scriptures. Timothy imitated Paul as a disciple, but he did so as he continued in what he already knew and believed from whom he learned it. And that whom is plural. It looks ahead to that phrase, from childhood. Well, who was there with Timothy in his childhood from infancy? Well, it was his mother, and it was his grandmother. 
A couple of translations even say this, how from infancy you were acquainted with the Holy Scriptures. Which are what at the time? Well, it was the Old Testament, wasn't it? And so Paul had them understand as they reasoned wherever he went that those scriptures that Timothy was acquainted with pointed to Jesus Christ. The most precious and important thing you'll ever do for your children, mothers, is give them Jesus. Give them the knowledge of who he is and what he has done and who they are and what they've done. From infancy or childhood, think about that. I think there are two errors when it comes to young children in the church and in faith that, that people fall into. Some groups that believe that just because you're a Christian, then your children are Christian automatically too. And that's why certain groups baptize them. I'm a Christian, they're a Christian, everybody's a Christian in the household. But faith is not by proxy. It's not genetic. The other error is that some people think that very young children can't believe at all. So either they're labeled as Christians when there's no evidence of faith whatsoever, or they're looked at as they can't possibly be because they're so young. I think both are wrong, because faith is a gift, right? And God can bestow it on anyone he wants. So we need to be careful of both of those things. We need to train them up and not just assume things about them, either for good or for bad, that they can't understand or they understand and there's no evidence that they do understand. Yet Paul, back in our text in verse 5, recognizes the faith he has seen in Lois and the faith that he has seen in Eunice to be present in Timothy. Notice it's the same faith. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, there's one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So whatever it was that that Eunice and Lois had, they passed down on to Timothy. It wasn't different. It was the same faith. Because there's only one. If you're going to pass down the faith, there's only one faith to pass down, isn't it? The faith of Jesus Christ. So moms and children and husbands, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about how important the role of a mother is in the realm of eternal life. I know you're busy. You don't get a lot of time to, to think about anything except for what's coming next. But I want you to think about the, the role that you have in the eternal life of your children. I want you to see the value that you bring to your children. Timothy grew up with Eunice and Lois who had a faith and they acquainted him with the scriptures. And he grew up to be the man that he was that helped Paul. I know that some days it doesn't seem like you're getting anything accomplished in this realm, does it? The dishes are piling up, chaos is ensuing, paints everywhere, you just step in something, you have no idea what it is. At some point, there's a cow that comes flying through the house. That's what life is like for a lot of mothers, isn't it? But it's your devotion, it's your faith, it's your sacrifice of you pouring into the children that God has given you, the gospel that makes the difference. The Father's you're not off the hook there, so if you're sleeping, wake up, because it is your responsibility to set the spiritual tone of the household. You should be instructing. So should the mothers, and vice versa. Mothers from childhood, you have a unique role. You, you're able to nurture your children in a way that no one else in their life can, including their fathers. It's a different thing, and it's proven every day. For example, here's how it works in my household. Okay? Maybe I'm spilling too many beans here, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm in the study, and I'm preparing for a sermon or a lesson, and I start hearing it. There's bickering going on, and there's fighting going on, and there's screaming, and I hear things crashing and glass breaking, and, and finally I, I build some builds, and then I come out, and I say, okay, that's enough. Dad's out here to speak. If you don't stop, I'm going to take all of your toys, and I'm going to sell them. And I'm going to use the money to buy you systematic theology books and you will sit there and read them until you are done. <laughs> and then when you're done with them, you're going to go open a stand at the corner and you're going to sell those books and you're going to use that money to buy a farm and you're going to work that farm every day to provide food for us. And with the overage, you're going to maybe have enough money to buy your toys back if you can be decent human beings. <laughs> and they sit there with this look like, what happened to Dad? And I look at my wife 
And say, what? <laughs> What's wrong with that? And she very, very calmly shakes her head. And she doesn't have to say anything. She, and the answer is, well, everything. <laughs> and then she goes in like a mother can and nurtures and trains and points them back to the gospel and then comes and instructs me on how to be kind. <laughs> but children, even adults, those of you who have had a godly mother, be grateful for that blessing. Spurgeon said this, here's your token Spurgeon quote, Never could it be possible for any man to estimate what he owes to a godly mother. Fathers and mothers are the most natural agents for God to use in the salvation of their children. I am sure that in my early youth, no teaching ever made such an impression upon my mind as the instruction of my mother. That's Spurgeon. Now Spurgeon being ornery, of course, he came from a family that was Presbyterian. They, they baptized infants. And so when his mother said to him, he said, Charles, I prayed and prayed and prayed that you would become a Christian, but never that you would become a Baptist. <laughs> and Spurgeon replied in his own way, then God has blessed you more than you know. <laughs> but I want you to know what Paul said. It wasn't so that Timothy would be an upright moral citizen. That was not the job of Eunice and Lois. No, from childhood he was acquainted with the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Moms, I want you to know something. As much as we want to, you cannot save your children. You can't. But you can provide the means for God to do so. Now this text hits home for me in particular because we actually have a grandmother on Heidi's side named Lois. <laughs> and you can't get through a conversation with her or get a note from her without some mention of the Lord. And I knew her daughter Kathy. And I had conversations with her, with her about the gospel. And then I see it and my own wife, and I see her pouring into my children the light of the world. So we may not think that moms are making a difference. So you get through the end of the day and you just want to crash. That's it. It's been one of those days. But Paul called Timothy's faith a sincere faith. It wasn't for him something that he just checked off the list. I don't imagine Eunice sitting there saying, okay, we've got to do Bible today. Okay, you got that. Okay, here's some of your lunch. Do some more Bible. Let's go to bed, go to nap. That's not how it was. They poured into Timothy because they had a sincere faith. And Paul calls it out. Sincere, genuine, without hypocrisy. So in other words, your children will know if there's hypocrisy. It's not just about your children's faith, it's about your faith too. You can't pass on what you don't have. Lois and Eunice had faith in God. They knew the scriptures and at some point... When Jesus was preached to them, out of their scriptures, they became Christians and they raised Timothy in the faith until he too took it as his own, probably at a very young age, and then became a trusted co-worker of God, it says, and of Paul in the ministry. And so because of this sincere faith, Paul continues in verse 6, he says this, For this reason, because of your sincere faith, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. See, Paul has been warning Timothy about what's, what's coming, about what's, what's going to happen in the churches. He's exhorting him to be ready. And the gift that he has is most likely, I think, the gift of preaching given by the Spirit, as he later then charges them, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, ju- who is, to, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So he's saying this, Timothy, don't let go. Don't be ashamed, Timothy, as so many of my other comrades have been. You know the scriptures from childhood. You were taught them. It's like one of my all-time favorite song lyrics. It says this, As you go forward, Timothy, you go back to the ancient path. You lash your heart to the ancient mast. And you hold on, boy, whatever you do, to the hope that's taken a hold of you. And you'll find your way. Paul wrote, I remember you, Timothy. 
I remember your tears. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. And for this reason, I remember, I remind, I remember. And so I'm reminding you that God gave you a spirit, not of fear, but of love and self-control. A faith that was given to you. And he says later in verse 12, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And then he exhorts Timothy the same way, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. I was late getting this to Janet for the bulletin, but the title of the sermon was A Motherly Deposit. It was given to Paul, it was given to Timothy, he says, guard it. You're going to have to pass it on. A deposit made by his mother and his grandmother. Fathers, I want you today to honor your wives knowing the critical work that they do. It's not just about changing diapers and, and making dinner and, and picking up the house and, and doing the laundry. I want you to realize that they're pouring into your children Jesus Christ. Children, kids, I want you to bless your mothers. They do a lot for you. And the most important thing they do for you is teach you God's word. And mothers, I want you to make this deposit of the gospel in your, in your children, no matter the age. It's often been said that you, you, you never really stop being a parent. The circumstances change, but you're still a parent. So no matter the age, you keep pouring into them. You may have a Timothy and may not realize it. I hope you don't have a Judas. But you may have a Timothy. And even if you don't, you're giving them what is able to make them wise for salvation. I want God to bless you this morning, knowing your difficult but critical work in God's kingdom. That is not in vain. And today we look at at the day and we celebrate and we say, okay, Mom, it's Mother's Day, you go take a nap. I got everything else. But if you're going to rest today, mothers, I encourage you to rest in Christ. That's where you're going to find refreshment and restoration from the long days that I know that you put in. Or rest in Christ. And if you get a nap on the side, that's good too. I want you to find rest in Christ Jesus and make that motherly deposit because someday that deposit will grow and the trees that we are planting now will sprout up in God's kingdom. And so the next generation hears that word as well. Let's pray this morning. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for my own mother. I thank you for the mothers here that labor so endlessly, so sacrificially to give up themselves that their children might know the word. And Father, I pray that if you would be so inclined to to talk to the mothers this morning, to, to reach their hearts who maybe don't know you, to make them aware of this, this great responsibility that they have. Not for their children's sake, but even for their own sake. That if they don't know you, they would know you. They would be able to have something to deposit into their families. Thank you for the work of those who have that and, and, and are doing, doing that constantly. And it's my prayer that as we recognize this day, we think of people like Eunice and Lois and, and and the women in our lives who work so tirelessly to, to build us up in the faith. Bless the rest of our time as we close with a song. And I thank you for these things. In the name of your Son, and our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.